left off with uh, Melchizedek, um, the author of Hebrews drawing the, uh, recounting that incident where Melchizedek uh, came out uh, to meet Abraham, um, uh, bringing bread and wine. And uh, after uh, uh, Abraham had uh, defeated these uh, uh, confederation of Canaanite kings, and he gave him a, 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 a tithe. Um, and this is, uh, let me re read uh, in verse, in chapter seven, beginning um, at verse, uh, at verse four. It says, see how great this man was to whom Abraham the, Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers, though these are descended from Abraham. But this man, speaking about Melchizedek, who does not have his descent from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who have the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who received uh, tithes, who uh, but one might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Um, and so, you know, the, this thing about the tithe, uh, it was stipulated in, in the law of Moses. Uh, and if you want to uh, find that, it's in uh, Numbers 18. Um, it says to the Levites, I have given every tithe in Israel for an inheritance in return for their service that they do, their service in the tent of meeting. Uh, and uh, then um, they were also to, to bless uh, the Israelites. Uh, Numbers 6, you know this one well, probably, speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, thus you shall bless the people of Israel and say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. So they shall put my name upon the people of Israel and I will bless them. Uh, and so these are the things that the Levitical priesthood was commanded to do. Well, the point the guy's making is that these are the same things that the Levitical priests who were descended from Abraham these are the same things that Abraham did uh, and received from Melchizedek. Uh, and, and it says, uh, yet pointing out the, the analogy is here that the Levitical priests had authority over the people as represented by the collection of their tithes and their commandment to be benefactors to the people and to bless them. Now, Abraham, we see, uh, the, all these priests were descendants of Abraham. Abraham recognized this inherent uh, and higher authority of Melchizedek uh, and paid homage to him and submitted to that by giving him a tithe and receiving a blessing from Melchizedek. And I, well, like I said, I think I said it last week, I always thought it was significant how Melchizedek brought out bread and wine. That has a little bit of a connotation to us uh, as, as Christians. Uh, I don't know how much to make of that, but uh, I've always thought that uh, was uh, maybe a little more significant, uh, um, you know, uh, topic there. But, uh, and so the whole point was, is that, that Abraham is the father of all of God's people, the father of all Israel, was in subjection to the priesthood, the superior priesthood of Melchizedek. And so um, this is the point he first wants to establish, uh, and then going to carry that uh, further from Genesis uh, up to, into Psalm 110. Um, and, uh, you know, as he points out, this uh, Melchizedek, we're giving... 
Uh, and uh, Lynn and I were talking about this just a little while ago. Who is this guy? I mean, we, we really don't know very much about him. Uh, and it says who does not, he does not have his descent from the, uh, from the descendants of Levi. And, uh, you know, but uh, he was obviously demonstrated uh, the, uh, the qualities of a priest and Abraham recognized this. So uh, this is the, the setup uh, for uh, this idea of a, of a better priesthood and a better covenant. Uh, that was uh, ultimately always in God's design. And uh, this is, I think, what uh, the guy is really trying uh, to help uh, get us to see and uh, get the, the Hebrews and the congregation to see that, you know, we sometimes wonder why God does things in the way he does them, but there's, uh, there seems to be a progressive revelation uh, of, uh, of God's person and his ultimate purpose uh, in, in, in redemption for his people that is, is culminated in Christ. And uh, even the first advent of Christ is, is really just one more progression because we know uh, that there's the day when, uh, uh, when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. And uh, that, uh, that's yet to come. And so uh, the, the uh, He's trying to get uh, his people to see that um, the Levitical priesthood and the Mosaic economy was only a, a uh, one more step in this progressive revelation that God had a had a better design in mind. And there were reasons for the uh, Mosaic economy and and the Levitical priesthood, uh, and they fulfilled those reasons, but they uh, weren't the uh, the ultimate. They weren't the final design. And so this, this is where he starts unpacking in, in verse 11 uh, to uh, the, the implications of, uh, of Christ's high priesthood uh, according to the order of Melchizedek. And, uh, you know, we have to kind of acknowledge the, um, how central the idea of a priest is to the whole economy of God. Uh, this is uh, this really got, was was predicated by the the by the fall. Uh, there wouldn't have been a need for a priest if there hadn't been the fall. Uh, once we uh, humanity fell from its uh, it's a place of grace uh, uh, in Eden. Uh, we were separated from God, from direct access to God. That remember how the cherubim with the flaming sword were placed at the gate uh, of Eden uh, back at the uh, in Genesis chapter three, and um, the uh, we were cut off from this holy God. Uh, because of uh, he, he was not a God who could look upon sin and to, for us to come in, into his presence uh, would be to experience a immediate death and dissolution. Um, but um, it was always God's design, you could see this in, in, in the original creation, to be able to have his people draw near to him. What did it say before the fall that Adam and, Eve, Adam and the Lord would do. They would walk together in the cool of the day. They would have these, uh, have this fellowship one with another. Uh, but now this fellowship had been broken because of, uh, of Adam's sin. And the, so God in his grace to, to provide a, a, a means of access for sinful people uh, established uh, a, a, a form of mediation now uh, and this was uh, to be mediated by a priest well you say well you know the priesthood came about later after genesis quite a bit later and that's true but we look back for evidence in the old testament and you can plainly see that uh, that job one of the great examples of this is job who acted as a priest uh, for his uh, for his family, he said that his sons and daughters would get together and they would eat and drink together, and, and Job would offer sacrifices on their behalf and pray to God for them in case some of them had sinned. 
we see right there that the familial patriarch uh, had the responsibility to act as, um, as the high priest for the family. We see Abraham do this. Uh, when Abraham built an altar uh, to the Lord and, and sacrificed on it, and uh, we, we, saw, we see Jacob do these, these same things, and uh, where they acted as priests uh, for, on behalf of their family. And so, uh, but this mediation was uh, only a temporary thing until uh, we were given a more formal priesthood in the, in the law of Moses uh, through, through the Levitical priesthood. Um, and so, you know, the Levitical priesthood, uh, I think Philip used this word in his sermon last week, was kind of a, a living parable. I like that idea. Uh, and it was a, uh, a picture of uh, what ultimately needed uh, to happen. Uh, the, the, the priests would, uh, would take my sacrifice of an innocent animal and that blood provisionally covered my sin and they would go to God uh, on my behalf since they were the only ones who had access into the holy place. And uh, at, uh, on the day of atonement, all of the sins of Israel uh, were placed on the scapegoat. Uh, and then they were also placed on the sacrificial lamb. One was killed, one was taken in. Only the high priest could take that blood in there. And then they would take the other goat out uh, and uh, let it be uh, uh, killed by wild animals in the, uh, in the wilderness. And so uh, this idea that uh, this intermediary uh, was a, a picture of something that, uh, that uh, much greater that needed to happen. I didn't have access uh, because of my sin. And even the priest to go in there and take that blood in there, uh, he even had to offer sacrifices for himself to cover, cover his own sins and uh, his own imperfections. Uh, and so this ability to draw near, we've already seen this language in um, in Hebrews, and we will see it more as we go in here, this, this, this ability to draw near to God uh, and to restore the, the nearness that we lost uh, in the Garden of Eden uh, is really what the priesthood is all about. Uh, uh, the, the Levitical priests were our intermediaries. They were our mediators to go and draw near on our behalf. He said, you know, here, God, here, here's the, the blood from uh, Robbie's transgression, uh, and uh, we're going to apply that, you know, on his behalf uh, to, uh, here at the altar and sprinkle the blood at the, at the foot and pour it out at the foot of the altar. And so uh, they, they, were, they were pointing to something that was bigger. And so this is uh, verse 11, uh, verses 11 through 14. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one named after the order of Aaron? For where there is a change in priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken was from another tribe. He's talking about Jesus here, from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about the priests. Now, I think what he's wanting to point out here, he says, you know, there should be, have been plenty of indicators that this Levitical priesthood was not the be all and end all for us drawing near to God. It was really only an, uh, an interim arrangement. Um, some of those things, and he'll talk about those more later, were uh, the necessary repetition of the sacrifice. I have to offer a, a sin offering every time. Uh, and I, I have to offer perfunctory ones, just even for sins that I have, uh, have might have forgotten about and have all, you know, committed and didn't, uh, didn't take note of before God. The priest had to do the same thing. And then, you know, the other part was the, the temporary nature of the priests. 
you know, a oh, high priest this year might be Eli. Well, next next uh, month it, it might be uh, Abimelech or uh, or um, you know Zadok or somebody else. Uh, and so the this priesthood was always in rotation. And he says, you know, these should be indicators to us that uh, the Levitical priesthood was really only a, an interim arrangement in, in God's uh, mind. And so he, 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 he's starting to tie Levitical, I mean, uh, Melchizedek's priesthood uh, to, to, to Jesus. And he says, what need would there have been for another priest? And, um, and, and it's a good question. Uh, uh, well, you know, well, the, why is there a need? Because it, obviously the, uh, the ministry of the Levitical priesthood was only, was not permanent. It didn't give you any lasting access to God. You, uh, you, you would go to the temple, you take your sacrifice, they pay for your sins, you go back, and then you have to repeat the whole process over again later on. And so there was no permanent uh, resolution for the problem uh, of, uh, of sin, which was really the, the purpose of the Levitical uh, priesthood was to forgive, uh, to, to manage forgiveness of sins before God. And so he starts, uh, the, uh, he says, th th this should point to the why there was a need for another priest. And uh, so he begins to tie it to Jesus. As I said, uh, you know, we, we refer to Jesus as a as savior and right, we, rightly we do. Um, but that, the, the title of savior encompasses a broad range of, uh, of vocations uh, that, that, that Christ uh, uh, had to do, um, you know, he's called the atoning sacrifice for our sins, the Lamb of God, uh, the um, firstborn from the dead, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, he's called our righteousness, uh, Christ our righteousness, and uh, those were all part of his ability to be our Savior. Uh, but the other one that uh, is really, really explained in any great detail uh, is uh, his uh, vocation as our high priest. Uh, and this is, this is really the treasure, I think, of, of the book of Hebrews. Uh, is, uh, that it, it identifies and um, explains the work of, uh, of Christ as, as a priest. Um, only... Uh, uh, a savior who was a priest and a mediator could actually uh, achieve the perfection that God wanted for his people. That's you know, what that way it began this verse. It said, if perfection had been attainable through the uh, Levitical priesthood, um, well, you know, that perfection was really the objective. Uh, and uh, the repetitiveness of the sacrifices should have shown that uh, uh, there, there was really no perfection, uh, no final perfection taking place. Well, uh, Christ uh, was perfect. Uh, he was, uh, and he was the only one who could make, uh, um, you know, the intercession that was needed and he could accomplish the perfection uh, for uh, sinners uh, that uh, that needed to be accomplished. Uh, the the Levitical thing was uh, was temporary and it was promissory, like our like our dollar bills or promissory notes. Uh, they're based on uh, uh, hopefully something else of value uh, of greater value than the uh, than the green paper itself. Well, uh, you know the the same thing was true of of uh, the Levitical uh, work of atonement that, that they were doing. And um, so it says uh, the necessity of another priest, um, this idea about perfection. One of the uh, commentators I was reading wrote this. I thought this was a pretty good uh, um, articulation of, uh, of the verse here. It says the author of Hebrews notes, drawing from Psalm 110, that perfection was unattainable under the Levitical system that was enshrined in the Mosaic law of the old covenant. And thus a greater order was necessary. The contrast then is that the priestly order of Melchizedek does actually bring the perfection 
that people need to stand in the presence of God. And, uh, you know, it talks about perfection being unattainable under the Levitical system. That, that reminds you of Romans uh, in chapter three, where it says, uh, there's uh, no justification, uh, therefore shall no flesh be justified uh, under the law. There's no justification through the law. Uh, and uh, the Levitical priesthood was a part of the Mosaic law. It was, it was part and parcel of it. I mean, there, uh, it was uh, the, the chief aspect of it really uh, was uh, the, the tabernacle. Uh, and uh, after, the, uh, after the moral law of God uh, was given in the uh, Ten Commandments. Now, yeah, speaking of the moral law, obviously the moral law uh, wouldn't change. Uh, that, was a, um, that, that was a permanent uh, aspect of the law, but the, uh, the, the, the ceremonial law did. Um, the, um, and then he, uh, he mentions here Christ being of the tribe of Judah. He was not a Levite. Okay, under the Mosaic law, he couldn't serve as a, as a priest. Uh, you remember uh, uh, King Uzziah. Uh, we, we heard King Uzziah's name when uh, Pastor Guillermo was here preaching. In the year King Uzziah died, well, what, was, what was Uzziah's sin? Anybody remember? He was generally one of the best, better kings of Israel, one of the good ones, but he screwed up late in his life. And he was struck with leprosy uh, until the day that he died and he was, had to be exiled from the people. You remember what his sin was? He presumed to go into the temple and burn incense. Oh. And what tribe would, he was a king of Judah. What tribe would he have been from? Judah. Judah, right. Uh, you, you can't do that. <laughs> God struck him in. The, the, the priest tried to stop him. He said, I'm the king. I can go in there and do anything I want. And so, you know, he took, uh, took incense in there and the Lord struck him with leprosy. You know, back and read about Isaiah sometime. He was a good king, except he had that, uh, he failed in that, uh, in that uh, understanding the law of God. And so you carry this forward, you know, how can Jesus be a priest if he's from the tribe of Judah? He's not from the tribe of uh, Levi and not a descendant of Aaron. Well, this is where Psalm 110 comes into play, and I think there's a good, good reason why this is the most quoted uh, psalm in the, in the New Testament. Um, the, uh, there's no doubt that both Jesus and Melchizedek were priests. Uh, Abraham's recognition of Melchizedek as a priest, and he's called a priest of God Most High back in Genesis 14, means that there was uh, another basis for, for priesthood other than being descended from Aaron, other than being from the tribe of Levi. And so uh, <laughs> it, it, that was your question, Linda. You said, uh, uh, how can this guy get to be a priest? How can this guy get to be a priest? Well, that's a, that's a good question. And, you know, the, I think the author of Hebrews felt compelled, to, feels compelled to answer that. Uh, verse 15 through 19. Um, talking about uh, the, the need for another priesthood uh, to arise. Um, he says this, this becomes necessary, it becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest, not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. He's referring to Psalm 110 there, Psalm 110 verse four. On the one hand, the former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. There's that draw near language again, mm -hmm. which is so much a part of, uh, of this book of Hebrews. It, so it was through this uh, priesthood after the order of Melchizedek that permanent and free access to God could finally be attained. And the first 
there's going to be two planks to this uh, um, that are the basis of uh, the, the, the platform, if you will, uh, or uh, for uh, Melchizedek's uh, priesthood, or the uh, Melchizedek, I should say Christ's priesthood. Uh, and the first is mentioned here, the power of an indestructible life. Okay, well, I'm sure that verse right there has a lot to do with the speculation uh, regarding uh, the uh, identity of, of Melchizedek. Uh, as he's saying that Melchizedek has an, had an indestructible life. Uh, it kind of seems to say that. I don't know that that's uh, exactly what was intended there. I suppose that's possible. Um, we've had, like I said, we're, there, um, there's a lot about this man that's uh, this mystery, but uh, obviously he was recognized uh, uh, by Abraham, uh, who, who was probably given the inside of the Holy Spirit uh, in this matter, uh, that uh, this man was a priest and uh, uh, was a, of a priestly order. Uh, we don't, uh, the indestructible life part uh, it's only, uh, you could say, well, just because it doesn't mention his lineage, Melchizedek was the son of, you know, thus and so, and the grandson of thus and so, and he begat this guy and this guy, and he died and was buried with his fathers, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, in, in a tomb. Uh, it, it may be that that's the sense of this indestructible life, but we certainly know in the case of Jesus, uh, there's a real indestructible life, uh, and uh, the basis for that was the fact that uh, he was uh, without sin and that Jesus was uh, our righteousness. Um, is, this a, is this a testimony to the righteousness of, of, of Melchizedek? Perhaps. Um, so uh, I don't think we have a real good answer on uh, the basis for Melchizedek's, but as a type, uh, as a picture of, uh, of Christ, uh, it, uh, it's a, uh, a, an excellent picture. Uh, we, we, we can see the parallels there without too much trouble. Um, Robbie. Yes. It, it, I'm with Linda. How did this guy just appear on the scene, but not just this guy, but this perfect guy, according to the way that Hebrews is describing him? How could a perfect guy just appear on the scene? Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, and that, you know, there, um, we know that uh, one eventually did, but it wasn't Melchizedek. Uh, and uh, the, uh, um, the, the power of the word of God here in Psalm 110 uh, have, to, have to figure into this uh, you've got Abraham's contact, which really consists of about like three or four verses at the most uh, in Genesis 14. And then you have this one verse in, in Psalm 110. Bear in mind that Jesus uses Psalm 110 uh, to uh, affirm that the, he's the one who's being prophesied of. Uh, in Psalm 110, and that he is actually the, uh, not just David's son, he is the divine son of God, and uh, Matthew, I think it's Matthew 22, where he confronts the, uh, the scribes and the Pharisees, and they say, well, he asked them, just let me ask you a question, whose son is the Christ, and they said, the son of David, and then he quotes Psalm 110. <laughs> which means I'm getting right here at the end of my time. Uh, and uh, the, um, saved by the bell, but uh, <laughs> the, uh, is that uh, Psalm 110 identified him as uh, the divine son of God. And also Psalm 110 says, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Um does that establish the uh, eternality of, of Melchizedek? Uh, you are a high priest forever, according to the uh, order of Melchizedek? Um, I don't know. Uh, 
I, it's hard to know much about Melchizedek. I don't have any problems in the eternality of, of, of the priesthood of Jesus Christ, though. And mm -hmm. God has said that he is a type uh, of, uh, of Melchiz Melchizedek is a type of Jesus. Uh, I think that's about uh, the, the most that we have to go on. But, you know, this was the, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. Those were the words of Yahweh. I mean, go back and read Psalm 110. It won't take you five minutes. It, it's only consists of about six or seven verses. And, 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 and read it in the context of which um, Jesus presents it to the scribes and the Pharisees. Uh, and, uh, and after he does this, uh, quoting that psalm and pointing out that that psalm was written by David. And David says his Lord speaks to the, the Lord speaks to his Lord in heaven. Uh, you get this, this view into heaven that uh, we're only granted uh, in that one psalm. And uh, after this, the scribes and the Pharisees, it says, dared to ask him no more questions. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, they didn't have an answer for that you know, because that, that psalm sort of put, uh, put an end to the argument. And I guess that's really about the way the author of Hebrews is looking at it, is uh, that Psalm 110 as an inspired uh, uh, piece of scripture uh, and God's word uh, with respect to the Messiah uh, and um, has uh, establishes this connection uh, between Jesus and Melchizedek and uh, this connection of about this idea of a power of an indestructible life and uh, the uh, um, uh, an eternal uh, uh, forever priesthood, uh, and um, so that uh, I said probably a, uh, kind of we got our foot in the door there. We won't be back onto this uh, topic until um, Palm Sunday, <laughs> because mm -hmm. Pastor Yuri will be here on April third, and we don't meet. Uh, we won't be uh, meeting next week since Vivian and I will be uh, traveling. But um, anyway, uh, I, maybe, maybe you'd like to. Not only uh, read uh, chapter seven, but uh, go read uh, Psalm 110 in your spare mm -hmm. time and meditate on that a little bit, uh, and even look up that uh, point of reference uh, uh, in during Holy Week. I think it's in Matthew 21 or 22 where Jesus uh, debates with the scribes and Pharisees, and they will probably say something to the effect of "Whose son is the Christ?" And uh, this is where Jesus. Uh, um, you know, takes on the, that question and uses Psalm 110. Uh, and it's far from being the only place it's used in the New Testament, uh, as we've pointed out uh, frequently before. But anyway, um, we'll, uh, we'll leave off there and, and come back and deal with this uh, uh, eternal priesthood uh, when, uh, when I get back. And uh, I just hope uh, everybody... Uh, as a good and blessed and safe couple of weeks, uh, we'll stay in touch by uh, by our emails and so forth. And uh, it's safe travels for you and, well, thank and you. Vivian. Thank you so much. Yeah, I know. It's uh, hard to be safe even here in Jacksonville. You <laughs> outside mm -hmm. the city limits, you know, it gets uh, pretty crazy. Yeah. And well, um, let's uh, I'm gonna close us with a uh, with a prayer here. Our Heavenly Father, uh, and our Lord Jesus, our, our High Priest, uh, we uh, there's a lot we probably can't even begin to comprehend about the work you have done and even will do for us to not only save us but keep us saved as our very high priest and to give us the access to you that we are privileged to experience now as we come to you in prayer and um, it is uh, it is good uh, to call upon your name and to uh, know that uh, that you hear us and uh, we, uh, we we long to draw near uh, help us to to draw near in our uh, in our heart of hearts and to, to seek you with our all of our heart and soul and mind and strength 
and uh, we uh, ask that uh, you use this word to um, to guide us uh, in drawing near to you and to see uh, the, the wonderful things that you've done for us and to, and to praise you for it. And I uh, would pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bye, everybody. Have a good week. Thanks, yes, everyone. Have a good Bye. week. Enjoy the grandchildren. Well, thank you. <laughs> Get ready. Get your running shoes on. Oh, gosh, I know. Have fun. It'll, it'll, it'll be fun. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.